you know, it's interesting, that song that we just sang, uh, Lord, the light of your love is shining. I'm just amazed sometimes how God can coordinate the songs with the message, you know, without even us realizing it and thinking about it. But some of the words that we sang there, you know, about set us free by the truth you now bring us. I, I love lines like that. Um, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Uh, search me, try me, consume all my darkness. And some of, those, um, some of those lines are very profound, and yet so often we can, we can just sing them as a, as a song, a nice song. You know, we can think of lots of songs going back, you know, so many years now. I can, I've got so many songs in here. They're all in here. You don't think about them. But then something triggers, and boop, you're singing a song that you hadn't sung for 30 years. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you experience that? Because it's, it's in there. And, and we, we need to appreciate, as Christians, if our belief in Jesus Christ, if our relationship with him is not making a difference to the way we live, the way we think, and the things we say, then we're just flatlining. We have to be getting closer to him. And over these last few weeks, I've been sharing about the truth. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Today, we have so many different doctrines in the church, in the body of Jesus Christ. And it's important that, that we, we, we build our belief system from what the word of God says. Not what we would like it to say, but what it actually says. So today I'm going to start a little series. I don't know how long this will go for because it started off with 10 things that we should remember as Christians. 10 things. And then I, I was up to at least 20. And I thought, God, there's so much. So this, this may take a little, a little while. But we're going to look at some of the practicalities about our relationship with Jesus. If, if our relationship with Jesus is not practical in our outworking, then we're wasting our time. We're fooling ourselves. And 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 to 6, a passage that I use a lot because it is very important to us, and we're going to use it as our uh, springboard this morning. Paul says, examine yourselves. doesn't say examine other people or examine other institutions, or examine other, examine yourselves. Now listen, please, because this is very important to us. Don't let it be just words. This is God talking to his people. And he says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Most Christians today don't realize what it is to have Jesus Christ in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Everything is in him. As long as we are in him, we have everything that he, he wants to give to us. We have it at our disposal. It's a question of whether or not we're going to draw from it. And he says, unless indeed, now this is the scary part, unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Why? Because Paul and, and his uh, 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 work friends or associates, they were doing what the scripture says. They were doers of the word, not hearers only. So he, he's telling us, he's warning us, and he said, examine yourself, test yourself, Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Christ is in you? Jesus Christ is in us. And in Philippians, Natalie shared this just at the end there, and she didn't know what my, my message was going to be. In Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11, Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the mind that Christ had is the mind that should be in us. He says, and who, being in the form of God, in other words, Jesus Christ was divine. 
he is divine. He is God himself manifest on the earth. And he said he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Why? Because he was indeed God himself taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now remember, we're talking about let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. He said taking the form of a bondservant. How many of us here today or listening uh, or watching on the video actually consider themselves to be a servant, a bond servant? A servant is somebody who serves. And we, we need to realize that we are servants of Jesus Christ. We are his ambassadors. Taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Remember, we're talking about let this mind be in you. Are we humble? Do we exercise the humility of Jesus Christ? Or are we still, you know, justifying ourselves? Are we still thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think? But he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, remember, we're talking about let this mind be in you. He humbled himself. And he was obedient to the point of death. What is one of the requirements for a Christian? Die to self. We are to die to ourselves and to live for him. Therefore God, this is what happens when we do that, when we have his mind. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He goes on in chapter 2 of Philippians he says therefore because he, he gives this outline and he says therefore my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now, please listen to this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You've got no idea how much controversy that verse brings to the church. You've heard me talk uh, about Calvinism and Arminianism. Yes? Well, this, it comes from here. It basically stems from this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It gives the idea, if you just take it on its own, it gives you the idea that somehow you can find your own salvation. And this is what Arminians believe. They believe that we have to earn our salvation. And I totally reject that. But on the other hand, in verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. On the other side, you have the Calvinists who say, it's God, just it's the grace of God, and all you've got to do is give your life to him, and they, they actually go further and say, he will pick you, and then you're, you're home and host. So you've got this contradiction. But if we look at the passage, we see that there's a covenant here. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, because it's God who's working in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Can you see there's a covenant there? There's a covenant between us and Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he, at the Last Supper in Luke 22, 20, he said, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. This is a covenant. Now, a covenant is between at least two people. Oh, the only one that can make a covenant on his own is God. He makes, sometimes he makes a covenant with himself. But here we have a, 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 an example of the fact that we are in a covenant relationship with God. And if, if I could just quickly express the relationship of that covenant is he gives the commands and we do the obeying. That's the extent of the covenant. And that's very important for us. It's not all of us. It's not all of God. If it was all of God, everybody would come to know Jesus Christ because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
Does that make sense to you? That if God is so totally sovereign that he picks and chooses who he will save, that everybody would be saved because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If we don't come to repentance, we remain in our carnal state. So we've got to remember this is a covenant, and it's a conditional covenant. It is not a covenant that says, now that you've come to me, that's it, you're home and host. It's a conditional covenant. Please listen to these next couple of, of passages. Hebrews 3, 12 to 15. Beware, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief. He's talking to believers here in departing from the living God. Some people will argue that Hebrews is not for Christians, it's for the Hebrews. Well, Hebrews was a title given to it centuries after it was actually written. But if you read the book of Hebrews, you can see very clearly it's a, it's a message to believers about what happened to the Jews. It's not addressed to the Jews, it's addressed to believers, to us. And he says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Does that not say that if they depart from him, they were with him? Yes? So he's, he's saying, you can depart from the Lord. And he says, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Remember last week we talked about deceit, how deceptive things can be. We can look at things in life and get the total wrong interpretation. That's why the scripture says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And he says, beware, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if that little word, don't you wish that little word wasn't there? But he said, you become partakers of Jesus Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So he's talking to believers about what happened to the Israelites. And he says, don't let your hearts be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. They're murmuring and complaining and disputing, disobeying God. He said, don't let that happen to you. But if you hold fast your confidence to the end, you will not harden your hearts towards God. So we've got a, a very clear warning there that the covenant that we've entered into with Jesus Christ is conditional. And in Colossians chapter 1, 21 to 23, and you who were once alienated, once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. Is he talking to believers or non-believers? Believers. They've been reconciled. They were once alienated and enemies. In the body of his, he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If, there's the condition, if indeed you continue in the faith, remember the passage that we started with in Corinthians? Test yourself exactly to see if you're in the faith. This is important. And this is just the building block for, for the message, okay? This is, this is just a precursor. I might get into the message next week. We'll, we'll see how we go. If, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Now, you cannot read passages of scripture like this and think that the covenant that we are in with Jesus Christ is unconditional. Yes? I want you to see this. I don't, I don't want you to just hear my word. This is, in, in you, if you do a word search in the, in the New Testament in particular on the word if, you'd be surprised what it comes up with. We are in a conditional relationship with Jesus Christ. So long as we meet the terms of, uh, of the covenant on our part, if we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, he will always keep his part. He will never shirk from his part. But if we break our part, we break the covenant. He doesn't, but we can break 
that covenant and we can move away from the hope. Why do we hope for what we already have? We have a hope in Christ Jesus, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, so in the, in the light of um, examining yourselves and testing ourselves, these are some things that we should be constantly monitoring in our lives. This is what we should be doing to ourselves, examining ourselves, testing ourselves, proving out, do we not know ourselves to see whether we're in the faith? And these, these are some things that we should be constantly monitoring. And I, when I say constantly, I mean on a daily basis. This is a war. We are in a war. There is a battle going on in the spiritual realm between good and evil. Now, I think we, we just have to look at what's going on in the world today to realize that evil is rampant. It is rampant. And we have to ask ourselves, why? If the church, if the church was being the people that we should be and, and practicing the covenant in which we live, this world would be a different place. But we know that the flesh, the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the, the eyes, they're a hindrance to us. And that's why Jesus said, you've got to die to that. You've got to die to the flesh. Take off the old man, put on the new man. So we're, I'm just going to go a little bit today, see how far we get, and I'll continue this over the next few weeks. Because there are some things that we must take seriously. The Bible tells us in, in um, 2 Peter 1.10, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. We must do that. That's our responsibility, to make it sure. Being born again, coming into Jesus Christ, getting into Christ. You remember Nicodemus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we must first be born again. Coming to Jesus Christ, Believing in him and repenting and getting born again costs us nothing. I think you'd agree with that. Justification costs us nothing. But that is the beginning of the journey. To finish the journey, to, to reach the end of our faith and receive the salvation of ourselves will cost us everything. And we need to understand that. And there are some things that the flesh is very deceitful the, the carnal mind is very deceitful. And the Bible clearly tells us to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. Now, we don't like to hear this sort of thing, but it's true. It's all through the, the New Testament. This covenant that we have with Jesus Christ must not be taken for granted. It must not be treated lightly because our eternal destiny hinges on this. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if, and there it is again, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Hold fast that word which I preached to you. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us as the only begotten Son of the Father. The Word of God. We, we need to appreciate the passage of Scripture in John 8, 31, 32. If you abide in my Word, if you abide in my Word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We mentioned last week, we all know uh, verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But it comes immediately after his statement, if you abide in my word. Now, the first, the first thing that I want to look at today is, and you know this and I know this because I'll hammer you with this. Is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You like the hammer? Just keep breaking the rock in pieces. Keep hearing the twins. Sooner or later, sooner or later, I don't know if you've ever seen how they used to break big rocks. They just, 
not, not real heavy, but just constantly pounding. And then sooner or later, boom, the rock breaks. It just splits in two. And this is what can happen when we take the word of God seriously. We, we, we abide in it. We, we let it fill our hearts and minds. And when Jesus was tempted by the devil, remember one of the things that he, he said to Jesus? He said, if, if you are the son of God, remember the deceitfulness, if, if you are the son of God, Turn these stones, turn these rocks into, into bread. And this is Jesus' response in Matthew 4, 4. Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Just remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, we looked at this passage last week in, in uh, 2 Timothy, and just before that, it, he talks to Timothy and, and says, that you've known the Holy Scriptures from childhood, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. The Word of God. The Word of God is our life source. It's our bread that God has given to us. If we're not eating it, if we're not living in it, if it doesn't abide in us, please don't expect anything from God. He's given us the terms of the covenant. If we violate those terms, if we think that we can get through this, this walk that we're on without the word of God, we're fooling ourselves. It feeds us spiritually. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I was saying it's like that vaccination. It's a truth serum that, that God injects into us and it counters lies. It counters unbelief. It counters all the things that would come against us and try to steal us away from Jesus Christ. The temptations that the devil brings our way. We need to realize that the word of God is our defense. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. So are, are we living? Is, this is a fair question, is it not? Are we living by the word of God? This is not, a, this is not an idle or unfair question are we living by the word of God does the word of God abide in us because if it doesn't you won't know the truth and the truth will not set you free I hear people misquote that part they say the truth will set you free the truth doesn't set anybody free it's knowing the truth that sets you free to know it we need a revelation we need a revelation of the word of God like guys was sharing this morning you know after many, many years, suddenly the light comes on and you see something that you never saw before. I long for those, those times. It's a greater revelation. I want to get closer to Jesus Christ. We go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. So I've got to ask myself a question. Am I living on the word of God? Is the word of God living in me? Jesus Christ is the word of God. If I'm in him and he's in me, I have to feed myself spiritually with the written word of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, these are some of the things that the word of God tells us. These are the things by which we can test ourselves. Rejoice always. Come on, come on, say it with me. Rejoice always. It doesn't say Rejoice most of the time. Rejoice when things are going well. It says rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. It doesn't say pray for an hour. Pray once in a while. Pray for five. It says pray without ceasing. Now, are you, are you examining yourselves as we go through this? This is the word of God telling us what it should be like in the covenant that we're in. In everything, give thanks. Everything. Not just in the good things, in the good times, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I want to tell you something. I, I, the number of people that I have heard say to me over the years, I just wish I knew what the will of God was for my life. And you've probably all said, I've said it myself way back. 
I don't, I don't ask that anymore. I don't ask him to show me his will. He's already showing me his will. This is his will. There's more. You know, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you. We'll probably look at this next week. But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before your God. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ, who humbled himself. The Bible tells us what God's will is for our lives. What we normally are meaning when we say, I wish I knew what God's will was, is what does he want me to do? Yes? You think about it, when you think, I just wish I knew what God wanted me to do. And that's not the question, that's the wrong question. The question we should be asking is, how does God want me to be? And he wants me to be like Jesus. Now these, these are just some, these are just three little things here, but they're so significant to our lives. To rejoice always. You know, it is, it's difficult, and I'm not trying to, to, to make out that I rejoice always, because sometimes there's tough things go on, things happen, and you think, God, how, how can I count it all joy when I fall into various trials and testing? But the Bible tells us why I can count it all joy, because he's perfecting me, he's making me into a perfect person. When things come against me, when things happen, and I don't like it, I've got to say, hang on a second, I have to rejoice always in everything. I must give thanks and I must pray without ceasing. If I'm praying without ceasing, that means that I have to have a constant awareness of God. I have to be thinking about God. I have to be talking to God all the time. You know, I, I think you'd agree with me. Sometimes you just feel like you're doing all the talking. With God, when you go to God, you feel like you're doing all the talking, yeah? Yes, guys, yes, I can see you a little wry smile, yeah? Sometimes we talk to God, and we talk to God, and we talk to God, and we feel like we're not hearing anything. But I'll guarantee you, God is talking to us. And, and as we talk to him, I think you'd be surprised that sometimes we, we'll, we, just a little scenario, you know, we pray and we say, God, I need an answer for this. And, and you go where you don't hear anything. And then a little thought comes to your mind. Rejoice always. That's God talking to you. Remember Paul? He went to God and he, won, he, he petitioned with him to have the thorn of flesh taken away. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. When God says, when you go there with a problem and he says, rejoice always in all things. Give thanks. Just pray without ceasing. He's virtually saying, don't worry about the thorn in your flesh. I'll take care of that. My grace is sufficient for you. This is a sort of relationship we have with God. It's a covenant. We go to him and we talk to him. And we, we, we've got to stop thinking he's going to answer us the way we think he should. He talks to us through the scriptures. And if you don't have the scriptures in, abiding in you, you're not going to hear. Can you imagine, you know, we go to him with a question, we really want an answer, and the answer is in the filing cabinet of the scriptures. But if you don't know where to look for that file, you're going to miss out. And so we, we, we just, oh, God's not talking to me. No, he's talking to us, it's just we're not bothering to find out where the answer is. We think the answer is going to come verbally or, you know, we're going to hear, yes, you shall go to Dandenong today. Come on, he's more interested in who we are than what we do. Dwell in the, my, one of my favorite verses. Dwell in the land and do good. How, how simple can that be? Dwell in the land and do good. Trust in the Lord, feed on his faithfulness. That's him talking to me. He's telling me, so don't worry about what's going on around about. Just keep your eyes on me. Everything will be okay. And you know, 
sometimes things don't seem to be okay, but regardless of, of what happens, I will rejoice always. I will give thanks in all things, no matter what, no matter whether I understand. Sometimes it takes a little while, you know, because we're still very impulsive in our thinking, and we, we get a bad thought and we dwell on that bad thought. If we dwell on that bad thought, we're just drowning ourselves. We've got to bring our thoughts into captivity, into obedience to Jesus Christ. For this is the will of God in Christ. In Christ. Everything is in Christ. In Psalms 19.14, David said, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart so the things we say and the things that we think, he prays that God let them be acceptable in your sight. So we need to be aware. If, if we really want to examine ourselves, test ourselves, prove ourselves, if we really want to know ourselves, we need to be conscious of the things that we're thinking. You know it and I know it. So often we can be thinking stuff and we're not even thinking that we're thinking it. We're not even aware of what we're thinking. And we need to be aware of what we're thinking because that's where the enemy gets us. That's where the enemy comes with a little doubt. Did God say? You will not surely die. And, and if we listen to the wrong voice, he will take us down. He will take us down. So I, I, re, I remind, you know that song we sang this morning, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. How often do you apply the blood of Jesus in your life when you feel like you're under oppression? How often do we, we remind the devil, Jesus has won the victory, and I will rejoice. I'm not going to let circumstances take away my joy. Why should we let circumstances take away our joy? Why should it stop us praying? Why should it stop us giving thanks to God? And I haven't even got started yet. I, I may say that, God, please, let the words of my mouth and the, the, the thoughts and the intents of my heart be acceptable to you. This is why, remember in, in Hebrews, the word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, etc., etc., and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God fine-tunes us. It's, it's an antidote to sin and unbelief. And if we don't take it into ourselves, if we don't abide in him and his words abiding in us, don't expect to ask for things and get them. And don't expect to get stuff if we're asking for the wrong reason. Or if it's for selfish pleasure. We've got to ask in his name. It's all about the kingdom of God. Not, not about our well-being. Not about our life. Not about this. Not about that. It's all about Jesus Christ being in him. And being his servant. Dying to self and living for God. Now these, these are all things that you know. You know all these things, but when you put them all together in a, in a very short period of time, they become very real. And if, if we don't live out this, if we don't live it out, we're fooling ourselves. We justify ourselves as to why we should be unhappy. Oh, you don't know what I've been through, brother. You know, when you, when you say to people, how are you going? You say, oh, okay, under the circumstances. You know what my answer is to that? What are you doing under the circumstances? What are you doing under the circumstances? We live on top of the circumstances. We, we, are, we mount up on wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We've got to remember who we are in Christ Jesus. He's in a covenant relationship. You know, I, I still have difficulty grasping the fact that God, the creator of this incredible universe, loves me. Why on earth should he love us? But he does. And I believe that with all my heart. And I, I want to love him more. And I find it's, it's like momentum. You know, the more you seek God, 
the more you find him. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When we call out to the name, uh, on the name of the Lord, we are heard by him and he re- delivers us from our, our circumstances. Do we believe that? Or are they just words? Are they just scriptures? Remember what I asked the other day about um, how many people have been to the Statue of Liberty? A couple of people said yes. I said, what sort of impact did it have on your life? And said, no, no impact. And sometimes we can be like that with Jesus. We can be like that with the scriptures. Jesus said to the Pharisees, blessed are you who knowing these things does them. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Now, I, I do believe that God in these last days, he's, he wants his church back. He wants his, he wants his people back. The church, and I, it's so sad to say this, I've, I study church history. The church over the last couple of centuries has just gone downhill big time. It, it took the, the uh, charismatic renewal and the Pentecostal movement to reinvigorate the church a little bit. But look what happened uh, since the First and Second World Wars. You can guarantee when there's a revival, there'll be some unrest in the earth. You look what happened. You go back and have a look at the revivals that took place. Very soon after that, there's, there's a, a world war or the Napoleonic Wars. Or, it all came after renaissances and, and revivals and things of that nature. Because the devil counters what God is doing. But God also counters what the devil is doing. Now, if we're in a covenant with him, we need to be sure that we know and understand what God is doing on this planet today. What is he doing in our hearts? What is he trying to do with us, his people? And he's trying to capture us. And 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, um, I, I mentioned this last week. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not difficult to understand, is it? Do you find that difficult to understand? Bring bring every thought that is against Jesus Christ, bring it into captivity and cast it down. That's not difficult. But our problem is that we're not usually aware of what we're thinking. This is the big battlefield that the devil commands at the moment in the church. When you look at this transgender stuff, when you look at abortion and euthanasia, um, you look at all these, I mean, it's just nonsense gender dysphoria come on I've I've got such a big problem but when you look at it in the spiritual realm you realize we're in a battle between good and evil and and because we have drifted away from God we've become servants of the one we obey whether of sin to death or obedience to life and so we've we the world has tended to drift towards obeying the devil and so we suffer at his hands We are obeying him. He has become the master when we obey him. And that's why the world is in such a stupid place at the moment. 80 odd genders? You know, I I remember some years ago seeing a woman got married to the Tower of London. Sorry, not the Tower, the Tower Bridge. She got married. She had a a ceremony. Now, how the bridge said, I do, I I don't know. But, But she got married. She wanted to marry... London Bridge, you remember that? I mean, how stupid is that? Well, there's a spirit of stupor comes upon us when we give ourselves over to believe a lie. God said, and that's it. If God said he created man and woman, that's the end of the story. And I don't think you've got to be really intelligent to see the difference between a man and a woman. Although sometimes can be a little bit difficult, but when you, you know, I've got to be careful here, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, we, we've got, there, there's a difference between a man and a woman. That's how we propagate the human race. Because God created us that way. 
The minute we start to take God out of the picture, everything is possible. And you believe it. You believe a lie. And God gives us over to believe the lie. So what, what is the best counter to lies? The truth. The truth. It's why I, when, when I see so-called ministers of God supporting gay marriage and, and supporting abortion, they're not believing the truth. And it, it's, it's amazing. You can see, you shall know them by their fruit. And I think God, in these last days, he's, he's sorting out the wheat and the tares. He's sorting out the true covenant believers from those who are just accepting Jesus Christ. And so we've got to make sure that we examine ourselves, test ourselves. Do we not know ourselves? Whether we are in the faith. All these things are yours and about if. If. So t please take this seriously. We, we need to cast down anything that comes into our thinking that you think, no, God wouldn't like that. You know, how many times do we have thoughts and you, you realize, oh, I don't think God would be pleased with that thought. And we forget that he can hear us. He hears our thinking. And so we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful about what we're thinking. We have a bad thought, cast it down. Having a bad thought come into your mind, I, I think that you can't do anything about that. You know it and I know it. Thoughts will come in our head and we can't do it, but we can do something about whether we dwell on it or not. And the scripture advises us, cast down those thoughts and bring your thoughts into captivity, into obedience to Jesus Christ. Test ourselves. Are we doing that? Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Just some of the things that we've got to examine ourselves about. Are we experiencing this? Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, now ask yourself, test yourself with this. Is this you? Is this describing you? Whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. How often do we meditate on negatives? How often do we meditate and think about bad things? And Paul, Paul is warning us. He said, don't think about those. Cast them down. Bring your thoughts into captivity, into obedience to Jesus Christ. Let the thoughts, of, uh, sorry, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. We do things his way, things work out. And this is a learning process. It's a dying to self process. How many of you have um, discovered that dying to yourself is difficult? Yeah, it's difficult. Dying to yourself and living for God is difficult. And if you're not reading his word, if you're not consumed in his word, if it's not your daily bread, if we're not obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we will not be able to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We just can't do it without the word of God. We cannot do it without the word of God. The word of God is our bread. It's the bread of life. It's our spiritual food. And, and there's so many Christians around the world today that are mal, malnutrition. What's is that the word? Mal malnourished yes that's such a better word malnourished because they don't take the word in they don't read the word and you know the, the thing about the word is it takes discipline that's the bit we don't like it takes discipline it takes giving up some time that you might be doing other things so what's more important to you what's more important our spiritual food or our daily pleasure the question is ours. Examine yourself, test yourself, prove yourself. Does that make sense to you, all that? We're in a covenant, and these are the terms of the covenant. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. We know the verse. We know the, 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 you know, a lot of us have it as a memory verse, but do we believe it? 
Do we practice it? Because if we don't practice it, we don't really believe it. We just accept it. So I just want to encourage you um, to get into your word a bit more. Take it seriously. It's our life source. Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. You know, when Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures looking for eternal life. And he said, it's the scriptures that tell you about me. And you missed me. They were so busy looking for eternal life, they missed the real eternal life. Jesus Christ is eternal life. In him, we have eternal life. The word of God. When he comes back, on a white horse, out of his mouth goes a sharp, two-edged sword, and his name is the Word of God. He, in the beginning was the Word, at the end, there's the Word. God created through words. He spoke them into existence. He controls everything by the Word of his power. You know, it's interesting that it says the Word of his power, not the power of his Word. It's the word of his power. You ever noticed that? Look it up. Have a look at it. It's interesting. Father, we are hungry for you, Lord God, and we ask you to make us more hungry. Lord, your word tells us we hunger and thirst after righteousness, after you, Lord, to, to know revelation, to have greater understanding of your kingdom, to know you better, Lord God. That's our heart's desire. We want to hear, Lord, on that day, Enter into your rest, not, I never knew you. We want to know you, Lord God. We want to know you more. And the best way to find out more about you, Lord, is to read your word, to understand your word, to meditate on your word, and to be doers of your word. And so we commit ourselves to you afresh, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.